Greetings, everyone, and welcome to podcast number 12 of Solar Coaster, A Diary of Me R- by R. Kelly with R. Kelly Appeal TV. We thank you so much for joining us today on this podcast. We're going to move right into the reading. Trade in my life. Understand this about me. There's the studio, the basketball court, the crib, and the road. The studio comes first. In the studio, the lady is music, and she possesses me more deeply than any woman. I need the basketball court for release. The competitive fire inside me needs to burn. If it don't burn it off, if I don't burn it off, it'll burn me up. I need a crib for privacy and protection. I love my fans, but some of them are aggressive to the point of craziness. In 1994, I found a converted church in a Lakeview section on Chicago's north side, an upscale in the city hood near Lincoln Park, the lakefront and Wrigley Field. I saw the place with its 10,000 square feet of living space as a blank canvas that I could paint any way I wanted. I'm a perfectionist in music and I'm a perfectionist in design. I was going to design this, my first major home according to my vision. For example, I envisioned an indoor pool and a basketball court and a spacious indoor rehearsal dance studio. I want a 27 foot stairwell in the living room, polished hardwood floors in the dining room, elaborate lighting and breathtaking art throughout the house. There simply had to be monster sound and home theater systems and great room with a great white piano as the centerpiece. I had a massive 1500 gallon in the wall aquarium um, installed with a pair of killer sharks swimming inside. I got that idea from a James Bond movie I saw. Thought it might make my place unique and give it attitude. My house was a place where I could take off the R. Kelly uniform and let Robert do his thing and be himself. In an interview with Vibe magazine in 2007, John Monopoly, at the time manager of Kanye West, Shawnee, and Ron Fest, talked about his experience at, how, at a house party I had once thrown. It wasn't the house I just described, but the so-called hood shit. Monopoly described hasn't changed. He watched women braiding my hair and how we hung out in the kitchen, singing, laughing, and talking shit. To Monopoly, this was a sign of my authenticity. From his perspective, it demonstrated my strong bond with the, with the public and connection to the street. While what Monopoly witnessed seems to convince him that I had genuine street creed back in 95, as in 2005, as in today, if you're hanging with me, I'm not R. Kelly, I'm Robert. A mama's boy who lives life and enjoys his life, his life, his friends, and his home. In fact, being connected with real life and real people is the only way my music can stay relevant. People tend to pamper R. Kelly, but with Robert, they can let their guard down and say what's on their minds and hearts. R. Kelly moves too fast and tries to pray to please too many people. That's not a bad thing. In fact, it's, a, it's good because it keeps me connected with my fans. But when I separate myself from the character and down to earth, it's Robert who picks up on the real vibes in the streets. The road was always calling me because it allows me to connect with my fans all around the world. I wanted to see them and they want to see me. I want to entertain them. I also found myself in the same position as thousands of male singers who came before me. If I sing a song that says, I want to seduce you and you alone, a woman takes that personally. And I want her to take it personally. I want the woman to feel like I want her and I want her to want me. All that translates into lots of ladies wanting me and in turn me wanting lots of ladies. Not too many years before I was a school kid with a reading problem who girls laughed at. Suddenly the kid became a superstar with a lifetime pass to an all-you-can-eat buffet. And on the menu is every kind of a beautiful woman you can imagine. Every shade, every shape. I was excited that my songs were so strong. Excited that my female fans liked the seduction. Excited that women were looking to seduce me. And I said, hell yeah. My love life started 
operating on the same level as my musical life. It was one gorgeous song after another. But even though I have the spirit of seduction, I also have a spirit that comes from God. The preacher in me is strong. When mom passed away, she went straight to heaven. I truly believe that the only way I'm going to see her again is to make it to heaven. After her death and all the sudden success, not to mention this hurricane of women coming at me, I was thrown into some serious confusion. The preacher and the seducer got to arguing. In 1995, at the start of my second solo album, R. Kelly, I decided to let my fans know everything going through my head, but I wanted the preacher to deliver the message. Earth is my uh, preacher's turf, and people relate to him because they feel he's taking directly, he's talking directly to them. The preacher is my music and my music. And although it's not the same as going to church, preaches. The intro on the record was called The Sermon. I preached like I was in church, a church organ playing behind my words with the sisters and brothers responded to the calls, yelling amen and preach, Brother Kelly. I said, before I start, I just want to get a few things off my chest. You see, being in this business that I'm in looks like everything I do, everywhere I go, and everything I see seems to be through some kind of magnifying glass. Can I talk about it? <laughs> While you're looking, I suggest you take a good look and I hope you find just what it is you're looking for. Just like that song say, ain't nobody business what I do. Now, can I move on? I remember when I was trying to be somebody, but I just didn't know nobody. Now, ever since God has blessed me, it seems that there's, there's things that are going a little bit different. Folks, ain't, ain't it funny how things can change sometimes? Why, even the Statue of Liberty wants some of my bump and grind. Can I get a witness off up in these Jeeps? Amen. I don't see nothing wrong with a little truth. You see, the good book says that the truth is the light. I think it's time to turn on your lights and see the truth. Can I talk on? You don't know where I've been. You don't know where I'm going and you don't know what I do. Can I get a witness? So before you go trying to pass judgment on me, pass judgment on yourself, worry about yourself and what yourself is doing and where yourself is going and who yourself has been with. That way you don't have to ever worry about nobody but Jesus. <laughs> From the pulpit, I had to get right to the dance floor. You remind me of something. The first single from R. Kelly album got some serious criticism. But that didn't bother me. I was proud of the song because I was freer with my metaphors. I've always wanted to express myself in ways that other guys never have. I was glad to write, you remind me of something. I just can't think of what it is. You remind me of a Jeep. I want to ride it. Something like my sound. I want to pump it. Girl, you look just like my car. I want to wax it. And sometimes like my bank account, I want to spend it. So put, so pull up to my bumper and let the system sound. Girl, I bet you I can drive you crazy. The song is a compliment to women, not an insult. We fellas like our Jeeps. We have our love. We love our cars. We love the speaker system in our rides. And naturally, we love our bank accounts when we got money. You can compare a woman to the moonlight and stars. You can compare her to a beautiful flower or an angel from above. All that's cool. But I wanted to come down to earth and make a comparison that was real to men. I was happy that the song got talked about. And I don't think I'm wrong in saying that the fans got a kick out of the lyrics. They provided that to me when they ran out and bought the single and it would hit the number one spot. The power of music inside me didn't pay any attention to debates about my musical direction. It simply kept feeding me more and more lyrics, more words, riffs, and rhythms. It got to a point where, and I know this may sound crazy, I talked to the notes in my head. I made them prove that they're worthy of completion. Come on, that all you got? What else? Bring it. Even before I was married to a woman, I was married to my work. Music feeds me more than I can consume sometimes. Mostly, it serves me in the wee hours of the night. So my engineers and staffers have to accommodate all night creative sessions because I still struggle with reading and writing. I've got old fashioned cassette re record recorders all around the house, in my cars, everywhere to catch those moments of pure inspiration. 
when a melody comes to me or some lines of lyrics, I've got to get them down fast. I have never, I have a near perfect memory, but I've got so many songs in my head that I've got to catch them as soon as they fight their way to the surface. So I'll hum the melody or the bass line, whatever it takes to come out into the cassette decks. Or now, one of my iPhones or iPads, or I'll call the studio and have the engineer record my ideas over the phone. From those bits of melody or rhythm, I'll continue to build. In the studio, I have my longtime musical director, Donnie Lau, who is also an accomplished guitarist. I have a couple of keyboard players and programmers on staff. I'll hum or imitate with my voice all the parts of the song, and Donnie will recreate the sounds of, in my head on the track. As the words come, I'll sing over the track and keep refining and refining until the song is done. I've created a life that basically <clears throat> revolves around music. I'm like that weird scientist who's locked in himself in the basement, experimenting, testing, and every since in and every once in a while blowing up stuff just to get that perfect formula. When the song I Can't Sleep came out, I originally wanted to cut it with Tony Braxton. It has her inflection and vocal attitude all over it. Tony had wanted me to produce her. Naturally, I said yes. I love her voice. When she came into the studio, though, she wasn't happy that I Can't Sleep was already written. She thought we'd be writing it together. Well, that's never been my style. I'm the Lone Ranger. I prefer to write alone because I'm as much a word man as a music man. I have both bases covered and I don't like um, and I'm not looking for a collaborator. It's not that I don't recognize the greatness of others' works, but I but what I do, I do alone. Tony was unprepared for my way of making music. Just listen to the song first, Tony. I said, it'll fit you like a custom made dress. If a producer, if I produce the song that fit Michael Jackson, I knew I could produce a song that fit Tony. After listening to I Can't Sleep, she said she liked it. But then came the tough part, producing it. Because I had re-sculpted the melody with Tony in mind, I knew exactly the way it would go. She just had to follow my roadmap, except Tony didn't want to follow. Sorry, Rob, she said, I don't hear it that way. But Tony said, that's the way it's written. Well, I'm changing it. Then you're ruining it. Just because I'm singing it differently than you want it sung doesn't mean I'm ruining it. It's a hit the way it's written, I insisted. I don't think so. Well, I said, you're certainly entitled to your opinion, and I'm entitled to take back my song, so I will. At that point, Tony and I agreed to disagree. She realized, like the Lakers and the Celtics, we just weren't going to get along. What Tony rejected, I accepted. I recorded I Can't Sleep Myself on 95 self-titled album, R. Kelly. It went number one. The download story started with me riding around L.A. where I saw Ronald Isley walking down Sunset Strip. I had my driver stop the car so I could get out and holler at him. Ronald Isley, man, you don't know how much I love your music. You don't know how much my mother loved your music. I bet you don't even know who I am. Are you kidding, brother? You're R. Kelly. You got the hits. He looked at me like I'd accomplished what he'd accomplished. I can believe it. All I could say was, well, I believe I got some hits for you. I'm looking to make the kind of music my people listen to on the porch when we were growing up. You feel me? I feel you. But what do I call you, brother? What does the R stand for? The R is for Robert. And Robert is ready to roll with the Isleys if the Isleys are ready to roll with the R. We roll now. That very day, we went to the studio where I played some tracks for Ronald. He loved them all. The very first song we did was Down Low, where I sang lead, but used Ronald as, and his brother Ernie predominantly in the background. You can't help but hear the Isley vibe on that record. I was careful to respectfully label the song Down Low, Nobody Has to Know, featuring Ronald and Ernie Isley. When it came time to make a video, I already knew the whole story. It was like a movie in my head. When I wrote the song, I was the young dude kicking it with the woman of a super bad gangster named Mr. Biggs. I cast Ronald in the role of Mr. Biggs and suddenly both his face and his voice were back in the media. He told me that the song and the music video propelled him into a whole new career. Hanging with Ronald was like being with the teacher. I always learned something new from him. 
like any writer or director, I took great pride in giving the Mr. Biggs character life. The Isley Brothers were one of my mom's favorite groups. I was truly humbled to work with them. My only regret was that my mom couldn't see her baby boy sing with the Isleys. Just as Down Low had me looking at the past, my collaboration with Notorious Big, you, you To Be Happy on the same album had me look into the future. I saw that staying in the present, I could ride on both sides of the road. New flavored old school, R&B and rap heavy hip hop. God and music. The other side of the R. Kelly album testified to my relationship with God. It may be heard for some to understand, but it considered what was happening on stage with my music as steps I was taking towards God, if not for him. I couldn't have come that far. For whatever else was happening in my crazy life, God was happening. God can't help but happen. God's always there. With all the success of 12 Play, with all the pain that came with my mother's death, with all the willing women surrounding me, I felt the need to reach out to the Lord for help. I needed him bad. I loved him deeply, even on a love song like Baby, Baby, Baby. I asked my baby to take me to church on Sunday morning where I can thank the Lord, I sang. Let's say a prayer together. Heavenly Father, which art in heaven, I pray that you keep this love together. Same thing was true with Thank God is Friday. I took the title seriously. On one level, the song was about Friday night disco lights feeling right, but I had to bring God into it. I addressed the Lord when I sang, Heavenly Father, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. So many looking, looking. I was one of those people looking. As I reached the end of the album, I reached out to God again in a song called As I Look Into My Life. As I look into my life, searching for that paradise, oh Lord, will you help me find me, take this crazy ghetto past of mine and put it all behind me. I concluded the R. Kelly album with a prayer song I wrote called Trade In My Life. I sang about sitting here wondering how things go so wrong and came to the conclusion that I had to give my life to God. I said, I love my music and I love my fans, but I've got to step back, look at this thing like it surely is. What does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? I'm going to trade it to be with you from the depth of my heart. Uh, uh, uh. That was the greatest song. I love that song. R. Kelly ended on a holy conclusion when the love of a woman, the love of music, and the love of God all came together in a single song, Trade in My Life was an affirmation of my love for Jesus, the same Jesus who threw my mother I met as a little boy, the same Jesus who lived in the mind and soul of Lena McClain, and the same Jesus who had blessed me with the talent that had taken me from the dirt to my dreams. The R. Kelly album and my lyrics seriously confess, confused many music critics and fans. Mixing the spiritual with the sensual was, a, was as hard feat for many. Some speculated that my mother's death was the beginning of a spiritual awakening for me. My critics wrote that R. Kelly was wrestling with both sexual and spiritual concerns. And some people took offense and asked, accused me of twisting things up. There weren't many artists who had so boldly combined the secular and the sacred. Some detractors speculated that the album confirmed that, like so many before me, I was lost and uncertain about who I wanted to serve. Oh, I knew who I wanted to serve, all right, but I wanted to be honest. My mother's death affected me greatly, but it didn't constitute a spiritual awakening. The seeds of God, church, and religion had been permanently planted in my life by my mother and Pastor McClinn. I had never walked away from God. In my late 20s, I was going through some personal trauma. I was thinking about my future and what I was doing with my life and career. Writing and singing about these inner conflicts on stage was just my way of taking steps toward God. He created me. Surely he'd help me if I asked. The rumor mill really blew up in 97 about my surprise appearance at a gospel concert in Chicago. Looking back on my comments that night, I understand why many expected me to abandon R&B and make a full-fledged conversion to gospel. I talked about my obsession with money and material possessions and being the center of attention for women in the media. Here stands a broken man, I shouted. I used to be flying in sin, now I'm flying in Jesus. I want to be clear here. I never considered my 
music sinful for the most part. What people see on stage are Kelly bumping and grinding, dropping my pants and do some women. That's all show business. What I do on stage does not mean I jump off the stage and continue my act in real life. My, if my fans and critics should see me as I worship, feel the spirit, praising and praying or seeking guidance from my pastor, they know that God is and has always been essential to my life. At the concert, I was expressing my faith, acknowledging God and honestly admitting that I have some serious work to do if I ever plan to join Joy and Kelly in heaven. world. God blessed me with the ability to create both. Take away the seductive lyrics and they can be easily replaced with gospel. I was grateful when one of the great contemporary gospel singers came looking for me. He knocked on my door and said, Rob, let me help you, brother. I felt his spirit and genuine love of God. I went into his prayer circle and received many blessings from his insight into the Lord. But because God gave me a discerning nature, even in the midst of a powerful prayer circle, I was aware of what was happening around me. Example, I was seated in a room in a prayer circle, br circle, brothers and sisters who had dedicated their life to the Lord. A sister asked us to all hold hands as she led us in prayer. When I pray, I get emotional. I give my heart over completely to the sacred moment. I can start crying, shaking, even talking in tongues. Anything might happen when I pray. This time I fell to my knees, calling out to God and thanking him for his grace. As I fell, though, I noticed the group leader had his little video camera aimed at me. As he was catching me on tape, I heard him, t him talking on his cell. Yes, we have R. Kelly with us. R. Kelly is saved. R. Kelly is in our prayer circle. I, don't, I didn't like that. Prayer is a personal thing. Prayer is private. Broadcasting my religious moment in this particular manner killed the moment for me. I wasn't on my knees to create a photo op. I was on my knees because I was humbling myself before God. I didn't need to have that image go out to the world. That kind of publicity left a bad taste in my mouth. Today, just as it was back in the late 90s, I'll keep on expressing what's in my heart, be it sexual, spiritual, or just entertaining. People shouldn't go so deep into psychological psychology um, with R. Kelly. If you like my music, buy my music. If you don't like it, don't buy it. I love you either way. I loved hearing those. I loved hearing those words, but I had also made a promise to myself. I had promised to trade in my life. That meant concentrating on the spiritual gifts God had given me. I knew that spirit would grow. If I could concentrate on one woman and one woman alone, when I watched Andrea Kelly dance across the stage, my eyes and heart told me that she was that woman. Drea was more than just a great dancer. Drea, coming up, I was taught that every Christian has a past and every sinner has a future. As both Christian and sinner, I wanted to live in the present tense with God. I felt that my heart was ready for humanity and the demons surrounded me. For example, the drama of empty love affairs needed to stop. I felt like I wanted to be checked. I needed to be checked. My ego, while insisting that the music I do today is better than what I did yesterday, was not 24-hour ego. I needed it for business negotiations and for confidence, but I was learning to keep it by my side. If I got in front of my ego, it would run me over. If I ran along it, I could wear it. I could wear it out. I also knew that love, true love for another human being was another way to defeat my ego. I was auditioning dancers for the upcoming tour when I felt the first spark of that love. We'd gone through a hundred dancers to choose six. Of the final six, one grabbed my full attention. She did car wheels and splits with a flexibility and grace that knocked me out. I couldn't keep my eyes off of her. She was a brilliant athlete, but also an artist. In that way, that her moves told a story. She was sensuous and she was sexy and she was downright spectacular. She got the job and before long, I got a beautiful girlfriend. Her name was Andrea Lee. Her story and mine flowed together in a natural way. Her friendly sweetness and outgoing personality reminded me of my mother. She was also a firecracker. You wouldn't meet a stronger person. She had the heart of a lioness. Drea calmed my inner storms. She was my medicine. A wonderful woman who understood my unexplainables. I made up in my mind that I would introduce Robert to her. She's seen R. Kelly, the performer, the party guy, the player, the music mongo. In Drea's company, I didn't need to be R. Kelly. 
I could be Robert, the guy without the swagger, who still loves cartoons, who praises God and struggles with his worth and his sometimes overwhelming gift. With Drea, I can relax and reveal all of my past, my secrets and my fears. I could open my heart. Drea was more than just a great dancer. Like me, she could choreograph and soon we were sharing that duty. One day on tour, I saw her in the back of the bus reading the Bible. You take that book seriously, don't you? I asked. Sure do. Do you? Very seriously. How would you feel if I asked you to go to church? Drea asked. I feel good, baby. Church is what I need. Since the experience with the prayer circle, my heart had been a little hardened towards religious leaders, but I knew that God is bigger than any of his servants. Like me, all of his servants are flawed. Then we'll go to church, she asked. I love that, Drea. We started going, which was when I started to feel committed. I saw that my relationship with God was more important than anything. If I was going to give up the party life, God was the only way. Meanwhile, my sister Teresa had gotten saved and was active in a big church with a powerful preacher. She urged us to go to her church with her, and we did. The preacher put me in the front row next to Teresa, and his sermons had me up on my feet. I was shouting and praising and crying out the name of Jesus with no inhibitions. It felt good. Soon the preacher saw that I was catching the Holy Ghost and wanted me to travel with him to various cities. Part of me knew that, like the leader of the prayer circle before, he was showing me off. But another part of me felt flattered and desired his company. He was teaching me the word. When Drea and I went to church, though, I noticed that Teresa was no longer sitting in the first pew with us. Why? I asked her. The first pew is for the important folk. Come on, I said. There's no velvet rope in church. You stay up on up there in the front, she said. I'm cool back here. Sometimes when I fell to my knees and started talking in tongues, I saw that the little cameras usually aimed at the pulpit were turned in my direction. I was on display. This time, though, I wasn't going to let them keep me from God. I even decided to tithe, and it was a great sum of money. You sure you want to do this, Rob? Asked Daryl McDiv McDavid, who's been my trusted business manager from the get-go. We're talking about millions. Do it, I instructed. I also wanted to write gospel songs and join the church's min music ministry. There, though, the pastor drew the line. I could sing along with everyone else, but as far as getting up there or presenting original compositions, they said no. My reputation as the bump and grind man didn't allow me that platform. They felt okay about t taking the bump and grind money, but they were afraid of what the Christian community would say if my music got mixed with theirs. Fine. I wasn't there to argue. I was there to worship. Weeks went by and then months I was doing well. Drea and I became a loving couple. I managed to put most of my partying in the past, but a tour was coming up and a tour mean, meant the chance to party even more. A tour meant meeting a lot of female fans. Like my albums and the music I produced for others, I wanted my tours to be successful. It's hard for me to concentrate on anything but success when I'm in that mode. A successful tour means parties, clubs, playing the role to get people to buy albums, guys going woof, woof, woof before you even come on stage and women screaming your name, throwing themselves at you. I can't lie. Sometimes it all feels pretty unreal. The tour was about a week old when I knew I needed help. Temptations were up in my face. Women were handling, handing me cards with photographs and phone numbers. I was with Drea, but my mind was wandering. I called Teresa and asked whether she'd come out on the road and bring her prayer warriors with her. She said yes. When they arrived, we went into the room and prayed for hours, serious praying, crying, pleading. I stay on the right path. After the show, though, three ladies approached me with an offer that blew my mind. They were fine, and they wanted me to join them in their room, just the four of us. They were staying in the same hotel as Drea, Teresa, and me. I said, wow, that sounds incredible, but I got a pass. I'm trying to stay on a straight and narrow. Will said, one of them, in case you change your mind, we're in room 1305. We'll be up all night waiting. I told myself not to think about it, to forget the number. But of course, that's all I thought about. In my mind, the number 1305 was, light, was lit brighter than an opening night marquee. I told myself I go to bed early. Drea, who had danced in the show, was tired and was ready to call it a night. We got into bed and she quickly fell asleep. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't stop imagining those three ladies. Drea was out like a light. So when I crept out the bed, she didn't hear me. 
I got dressed. I went to the door. Then I changed my mind. I got undressed again, put my pajamas back on and slipped back in the bed. I didn't want to do wrong. I wanted to stay with Drea. I wanted to sleep. But every time I closed my eyes, the image of those women waiting for me back came back. I got out of bed a second time. I got dressed a second time. I put on my hand. I put my hand on the doorknob. I leaned against the door. I slid down to the floor and silently prayed. God, if you don't want me to go to these fine ladies, give me a sign. Show me something. There was no sign. I wasn't shown a thing. I got back up, turned the knob and carefully not to make any noise, walked out the room into the hallway. It was an atrium hotel where you could see people walking up and down the hot, ha, hallways below and above you room 1305 they said they'd be up all night said they'd be waiting i didn't want to go i wanted to go i was going walked to the all glass see-through elevators punched the button i was on 20 i was headed to 13 just then i looked and saw Teresa on the floor above she waved i waved back i felt convicted but the devil flesh was driving my motor. There was no turning back. Elevator arrived. Doors open. It was empty. I walked in, punched the button that said 13. Doors closed. I waited for the elevator to start going up, but it didn't move. I pressed 13 again, sensing something was wrong. I pressed the open door button. Nothing. The elevator was stuck. I got my sign. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I had to stay on that elevator a half hour before the machines arrived to focus on the open door and set me free. The amount of time I spent waiting for my physical freedom helped me win my spiritual freedom. I didn't go to room 1305. I went back to Drea, but the story isn't that simple. Stories rare, rarely are. After the tour was over and we went back home, one of the women had prayed me into the church started coming on to me. She slipped me her number and said something about how she liked to do crazy things with red lipstick. We met at her place in secret. We messed around and were ready to kick it for real when I stopped and started crying. We can't do this. I said, <clears throat> you helped bring me back to God. And here we are doing what we know damn well God don't want us to do. She backed off. I'm sorry, Rob. She said, you're 100% right. I'm weak and you're strong. I need your strength to stop this. And we stopped, except a week later when she called and said something about a new shade of red lipstick. We were back at it. I was back in prayer. Father God, I prayed. I might not be righteous now, but you know that my desire is to be righteous. There's a blessing right there, Lord. For so many years, I didn't even have that desire. I pray, Father God, that you let that desire grow. I pray that I become the man I want to be for you, for Drea, and for my family. I want to lead. I wanted a family of my own. I wanted a Cosby-like family, and I wanted Drea to be the mother of my children. I knew what I had to do. When I reached the decision, I was on the road. Drea was back in Chicago. I called my sister Teresa and told her to bring Drea to the private airport where I'd be landing, except I couldn't be landing in the plane. I had hired a helicopter. Bring Drea out to the tarmac, I told Teresa. Get as close to the chopper as they'd allow. I want to make sure that she can barely hear me over the noise. I want her hair to be blowing in the wind from the propellers. I want it to look like a scene out of a movie. I want us to be in that scene. I want it to be the most romantic moment of her life. It was. The sun was shining that day. The chopper came down out of the sky. Drea was waiting on the tarmac. I jumped out and walked over to her. Her hair was blowing in the wind. I fell on my knees. I had to scream above the roar of the engine. Baby girl, I roared. I love you. I took the small box out of my pocket and handed the ring to her. Baby girl, I hollered even louder, will you marry me? She was crying. She said something, but the noise of the chopper didn't let her hear it. Say it louder, I said. She said it again. I still couldn't hear it. You got to scream, baby, I said. You got to scream, I can hear. I love you, she screamed with all her might. And yes, 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 I will marry you. I will marry you. It was a, it was as beautiful as a scene in an, any movie. A marriage, a family of... Everything I'd ever wanted, a dream coming true. To make the dream even better, though, and to be sure it was righteous, I decided that we should have no sex until our wedding night. Drea agreed it was going to be difficult, but it would be worth it. It would mean that for eight months between our proposal and our marriage, love, not lust, would be growing between us. Our love would remain pure. I had a target date for the wedding, Valentine's Day. I had the perfect place for the wedding, Denver, Colorado, a high 
city closer to heaven. I could and did design the wedding so it would look like a fairy tale. I hired a half dozen violinists who played heavenly music. God, sm God smiled down on us and directed the snow to fall. It was romantic and the start of something that I believed in my heart would last a lifetime. Will you, Andrea Lee, take this man, Robert Kelly, to be your husband in sickness and health till death do you part? I do. Will you, Robert Kelly, take this woman, Andrea Lee, to be your wife in sickness and health till death do you part? I do. Then with God, as with witness, I pronounce you man and wife. Wife, We embraced, we cried, we were Mr. and Mrs. Robert Kelly. Okay, we're going to stop right there. And um, what are your thoughts about this? You know, knowing what we know now. Um, through the docu series with Andrea Lee and how she purported that he was such an abuser. Um, do you think we're going to see that in the book? Um, what do you think about um, about what we what we've read so far with the Isley Brothers and you know um, God and His music? I mean, you could tell that he was changing. He was definitely changing. Well, I thank you so much. We will see you on Monday and we will finish the next podcast, number 13, and we'll move on until the book is complete.